Welcome everyone to our midweek service here at Trinity Assembly of God. We continue with our series on the indwelling life of Christ, all of Him in all of me. That's the essence of the Christian life, is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now we're in the 34th chapter and it's titled, The Moment of Truth. Major Ian Thomas begins this way. He said, there is a moment of truth for every human soul to whom the Holy Spirit, through the human spirit, has revealed the wickedness of sin. It is easy to become familiar with Bible language without receiving any real revelation of truth. God wants to bring you, no matter how bitter may be the experience, to the place of self-discovery and to this moment of truth. We can know a lot of Christianese. We can even cite a lot of scripture. But God is wanting to give us a revelation in our spirit man and on the particular topic of our sinfulness. The moment of truth revealing the wickedness of sin in our lives. And then Major directs us to the seventh chapter of the book of Romans that we're going to do an exposition of in just a few moments. And it talks about part of us loving the law but struggling to keep it. Uh, another part of us, the uh, sin principle as he puts it, where uh, the flesh is trying to be dominant and so forth. And then he adds, the moment of truth comes when you quit exchanging courtesies with the flesh and repudiate it to its face, naming it for the treacherous, wicked, worthless thing that it is. And we have to come to that place in our life where we totally repudiate the flesh. We don't strike a compromise with the flesh. We don't try to have a peaceful coexistence with the flesh because in the flesh, that is in the self-centered way of living, living for self first. There's a satanically hostile attitude toward the law of God, toward the reestablishment of God's sovereignty in our life. He goes on and says, you realize that it was never God's purpose to improve the flesh, to educate or tame it, let alone Christianize it. It has always been God's purpose that the flesh, condemned, sentenced, and crucified with Jesus Christ, might be left buried in the tomb and replaced by the resurrection life of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. Nothing less than the accomplishment of that by the power of the Holy Spirit is the real true Christian ideal. And so, looking at this chapter of Romans, we're going to divide it into three parts because it really speaks about three different types of an individual. In verses 1 through 6, you see the law of God and the spiritual man, that is the committed saint, somebody who's living their life for Jesus Christ. Now, Paul describes men as either natural or either carnal or either uh, spiritual, natural, carnal, and spiritual, three divisions. The natural man is the unsaved man. He's ruled by his senses. The carnal man is a religious man, but is still dominated by the power of the flesh. He's under control of the old nature. And then the spiritual man, that is the believer. Uh, that's the one whose life is controlled by the Holy Spirit. You see these three men in Romans chapter 7. And so looking again in verses 1 through 6, you see, first of all, the spiritual man, that committed saint in their relationship to the law of God. That spiritual man is delivered from the law. The spiritual man knows that the law's power ends at death. Listen to verse 1. Or do you not know, brethren, for I speak to those who know the law. We're talking about a believer now. We're talking about brethren, uh, somebody who knows the law of God. A.W. Tozer, in his book, Path is the Power, uh, gives us an understanding of the weakness of the law of God. And let me quote for, from him. The weakness of the law was threefold. One, it could not cancel past sins, that is, it could not justify. Two, it could not make dead men live, that is, it could not regenerate. And three, it could not make bad hearts good. That is, it could not sanctify. You see, the law doesn't provide for forgiveness. You break it, you're punished. 
It doesn't provide for justification. The law doesn't provide for regeneration. It doesn't provide for sanctification. You break it, you're just guilty. You come under the condemnation of the law, righteously so, because the law is perfect, it's pure, it's holy. But we are sold into sin. And we understand that the law, according to Galatians 3.24, is a schoolmaster. The NIV calls it a tutorer to bring us to Christ. The law, it is a tutorer to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. Well, what does the law school us in or tutor us in? The fact that we're sinners. The law reveals the fact that you and I are sinners by showing us how we've broken it time and time and time again. The law has dominion over man as long as he lives, it says here. Uh, but that law shows our guilt and it points us to Jesus where we can find the fulfillment of the law. Because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 1.30 that Jesus is made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. The law couldn't provide righteousness, couldn't provide sanctification, couldn't provide redemption. That is to be found in Christ and the law points us to Christ for the answer to our dilemma. Now again, the law, it says in verse 1, has dominion over a man as long as he lives. And here Paul uses a marriage illustration to illustrate our relationship to the law once we become a believer. He goes on in verse 2, For the woman who has a husband is bound by the law to her husband as long as he lives. But if the husband dies, she's released from the law of her husband. So then if while her husband lives, she marries another man, she'll be called an adulteress. But if her husband dies, she's free from the law so that she is no adulteress, though she has married another man. If he lives or dies, lives or dies. If a woman is under a covenant with a man in marriage, she's bound to that covenant as long as that man lives. When that man dies, she is no longer under that covenant. And she is free to marry another. Before we became Christians, we were under the covenant of the law, the old system. And that law condemned us, righteously so. Uh, but we understand that when we die with Jesus Christ, when we've been crucified with Jesus Christ, when Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. When we've been crucified with Christ, a, de a dead person is no longer bound by that law. There was a woman that married a man that um, she found him after marriage to be very rigid. In fact, uh, he expected her to get up every morning and to make his breakfast and put everything together for him so he can go out and face the day. And during the day, he expected her to clean and sweep and dust and uh, various chores around the house. And then when he came home, he expected for her to have a dinner, hot dinner on the table for him. And in fact, he came up with a list of 10 rules that he kind of rigidly uh, adhered to in their relationship. The problem was there was no love in that relationship, and she tried to fulfill all of his expectations. Finally, this man died, and uh, later then she met another man and fell in love with this man, and this man was a very sweet-natured individual, a very loving, caring, tender individual. He didn't have all of these demands on his wife, all of these expectations on his wife. In fact, he worshiped the ground she walked on, was very sacrificial in her behalf. And she found herself loving this man like she didn't love that first husband and actually doing more for this man. Uh, going out of her way even farther than she did for her first husband because love was in the equation. And so again, this marriage illustration teaches that when we come to Christ, uh, we are identified with him in his death. And so we see that in the word of God. Uh, it shows us that the law's power ends at death. There's something we know and there's something that we show. We demonstrate that it ends at death. Instead of trying to have victory, it's like trying to be saved. He discovers the Christian, the spiritual man, a more thrilling way to victory. Uh, driving home this argument, Paul uh, 
about the power of the law ending in death. He says this, Therefore, my brethren, you also have become dead to the law through the body of Christ. That's the death of Jesus' body on the cross. Through the body of Christ, that you may be married to another, to him who was raised from the dead, that we should bear fruit to God. Because of our identification with Jesus on the cross, he died as our substitute, therefore he died as us. But we also died with him. And becoming dead with Jesus on the cross, we're freed from the covenant of the law. Now we're married to Jesus Christ, not the Ten Commandments, not the Old Covenant, not the law of God. And that spiritual man uh, shows not just a more thrilling way, but a more thorough way to living in victory. You see, there's the failure of the flesh that no longer haunts him. It says here, for when we were in the flesh... The sinful passions which were aroused by the law were at work in our members to, to bear fruit to death. He's talking about before they became saved, before they became a Christian, a brother, before they became a spiritual man. So there's the failure of the flesh that no longer haunts them and the letter of the law that no longer daunts them. But now we've been delivered from the law, having died to what we were held by, so that we should serve in the newness of the Spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. The Bible says the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. Thank God for the New Testament, the new covenant, the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's not the law uh, that's been put to death, but the believer has been put to death with Jesus Christ. And now we're married to another, that same Jesus Christ. We're in union with the Lord. So instead of seeking an outward conformity to the letter of the law, the law is established by the indwelling Christ in our hearts, written upon tablets of flesh, not tablets of stone. And we'll see that a little bit more. The believer indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God begins to fulfill the law of God out of love. Because that law, which was external from us, now has become internal or internalized by the indwelling presence of God. So you see, in verses 1 through 6, the law and the spiritual man, that's the committed saint, the child of God. And in verses 7 to 13, you see the law and the natural man. This is speaking of the careless sinner. And so if the spiritual man is delivered from the law, the natural man is doomed by the law of God. Again, a natural man is an unsaved man. And he found, first of all, that the law exposed the hidden nature of sin. And it did in two different ways. It revealed his sinful nature. Listen as Paul continues. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Certainly not. On the contrary, I would not have known sin except through the law. For I would not have known covetousness unless the law had said, you shall not covet. Again, I wouldn't have even known sin except through the law of God. It reveals the sinful nature. It revives the sinful nature. He continues, but sin taking opportunity by the commandment produced in me, this is again the natural man, the careless sinner, it produced in me, all manner of evil desire. For apart from the law, sin was dead. I was alive once without the law, but when the commandment came, sin revived and I died. Now, what does that mean? He's simply saying this, before the law of God came, before Mount Sinai, before Moses and the Ten Commandments, there was a freedom from an accusing conscience. And there was a kind of false peace that was brought about by man's arrogance in his uh, alienation from God. He just thought everything was okay in his natural sinful state. He was more or less careless. But when the Ten Commandment came, not only did it expose the hidden nature and reveal the sinfulness of his nature, revived the sinfulness of his nature. Uh, he said it produced all kinds of evil desires in me. Uh, I was once alive without the law. When law came, sin revived. Well, what does that mean? It's kind of like this. You, you, you see a, a bench in a park with a sign on it saying, wet paint, do not touch. Something's triggered in people to just 
want to go over there and touch it and find out for themselves. There's just an itch that starts itching uh, to want to do something that we're told not to do. It's just a part of the fallen human race. You know, your parents uh, give you some parameters, they give you some rules and so forth, and we push against those rules and do all we can to circumnavigate those rules as children because we are rule breakers by nature. And when the Ten Commandments was given, the flesh, the sinful nature in fallen humanity wanted to push back and it revived sin and created all kinds of uh, evil manner of desire. And so that is what's referred to as re reviving that sinful nature. You see, the law exposed the hidden nature of sin and exposed the hideous nature of sin. And it did again in two different ways. First of all, it exposed the ex seriousness of sin. Listen to verse 10. And the commandment which was to bring life, I found to bring death. For sin, taken occasion by the commandments, deceived me, and by it killed me. That's verses 10 and 11. If you search the scriptures out, you'll find out that all ten of the Ten Commandments carried with them the death penalty. And so every time he sinned, he was bringing death upon himself, the judgment of God. And so that sinfulness is, is brought out. He continues in verses 12 and 13. Therefore the law is holy and the commandment holy and just and good. Has then what that is that which is good become death to me? Certainly not. The law has it become dead. But sin, that it might appear sin, was producing death in me through what is good, so that sin through the commandment might become exceedingly sinful. So the law, the more it, we're exposed to the truths of the law and our vast violations of them that accumulate through the years, we begin to see the exceedingly sinfulness of our sin. There'll never be repentance. There'll never be conversion to Jesus Christ. Not thorough conversion to Jesus Christ until we're thoroughly convinced of the exceedingly sinfulness of our sins. And the law does that. So you see the law and the spiritual man in verses 1 through 6. And then you see the law and the natural man. That's the careless sinner. But the law is doing a work. And then you see in this third category the law and the carnal man. Now, it's been interpreted two different ways. That this is a, a reference to the Christian experience or... As most believe, and I do, that it's the picture of a convicted man, a man who is lost but has come now under the conviction of the Holy Spirit. God, a convicted sinner. Well, let's look at that. If the spiritual man is delivered from the law and the natural man is doomed by the law, then this carnal man is defeated by the law of God because then he's trying to fulfill the law now in the strength of his flesh. The only problem is his flesh is really diametrically opposed to the law of God and can't keep the law of God. The flesh is enmity against God and against the law of God. And this is more than Paul's personal confession. Confession is really the experience of every person as they pass that threshold of moral accountability. Uh, this carnal person and the law is referred to in verses 14 through 24. I'm going to read this and I want you to follow very closely to the language. It's a little tricky. For what we know, for we know rather that the law is spiritual, but I am carnal, sold under sin. For what I am do, doing, I do not understand. For what I will do, that I do not practice. But what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I do not want to do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells. For to will is present with me, but how to perform what is good I do not find. He's struggling to try to live it in his own strength. For the good that I will do, I do not do, but the evil I will not do, that I practice. Now, if I do what I will not do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. I find then a law that evil is present with me, that's the flesh, 
the one who wills to do good. For I delight in the law of God according to the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin which is in my members. And then his cry, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? This is a struggling man. I believe it's a convicted sinner that's had the light of the truth come upon him. But whether you interpreted it as a Christian sinner, Paul as a Pharisee, trying to keep the law in his own strength, uh, or you look at it as a backslidden Christian. Either way, this person cannot be right with God in this condition. This person cannot be in a state of justification with this horrible description that's going on. Listen to the Wesleyan commentary on this passage of Scripture. Whatever struggles with temptation and past patterns of sin the convert deals with, it could not be consistent to align this passage with a post-conversion Paul. Uh, in other words, this can't be Paul after he was saved. Certainly, this isn't a description of Paul as he was writing this chapter. How could he close chapter 7 with such a guilt-ridden description of himself and open chapter 8 with, There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, verse 1. We choose then the option followed by most scholars that Paul is continuing his discussion regarding his pre-conversion struggle with the goodness of the law and the seduction of sin in his daily experience. Now on this very chapter, Charles Finney, in one of his lectures to professing Christians, he has this to say, this word carnal, he uses once and only once in reference to Christians, and then it was in reference to persons who were in a very low state of religion. For ye are yet carnal, for whereas there is among you envy and strife and divisions, are you not carnal and walk as men? It's talking about the way the Corinthians walked. These Christians had backslidden, Finney said, and act as if they were not converted persons, but were carnal. The term itself generally, that term carnal, is generally used to signify the worst of sinners. Paul here defines it so. Carnal, sold under sin. Could that be said of Paul himself at the same time that he wrote this epistle? Was that his own experience? Was he sold under sin? Was that true of the great apostle? And then in a later remark, he adds, you see from this subject the true position of a vast many church members. They are all the while struggling under the law. They approve of the law, both in its precept and in its penalty. They feel condemned and desire relief, but still they're unhappy. They have no spirit of prayer, no communion with God, no evidence of adoption. They only refer to the seventh of Romans as their experience. Such a one will say, there is my experience exactly. Let me tell you that if this is your experience, you are yet in the gall of bitterness and the bonds of iniquity. You feel that you are in the bonds of guilt and you're overcome by iniquity and surely you know that that is bitter gall. Now don't cheat your soul by supposing that that such an experience as this, you can go and sit down alongside the Apostle Paul. You are yet carnal, sold under sin, and unless you embrace the gospel, you will be damned. And friends, anybody that would take this description of verses 14 through 24 and say that is a, a, a Christian, average Christian experience, friends, is selling you a bill of goods. I believe this is a man under conviction. Or if it is a backslidden Christian, someone who's gone back to living for self, living in the flesh, living self-centered instead of a Christ-centered life and struggling, struggling. They may continue to go to church and go to church for years, but they're in a backslidden state. Paul wasn't the last sinner to waller in this no man's land of conviction, but then he cries out, who? Who will deliver me from this body of death? And the answer just simply explodes from the text. Verse 25, I thank God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. 
When we receive Christ and Jesus becomes the Lord of our lives, he is the one who will deliver us from this struggle as he comes into our life and then begins to establish the righteousness of the law in our hearts. And then Romans 8 verses 1 through 4 continues. And understand there is no divisions, no chapter divisions, chapter 6, 7, and 8. Uh, in the original. So it's just a continuation of this thought. So I thank God, the one who will deliver me from this body of death is Jesus Christ, our Lord, when he's made Lord of our lives. Verse 1 of Romans 8 continues. There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ who do not walk, now it's talking of, not talking about your position, it's talking about your walk or your lifestyle, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For the, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death, that is the Ten Commandments. For what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, that is our flesh, God did by sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh. Jesus never sinned, but he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. On account of sin, he condemned sin in the flesh. Why? That the righteous requirements of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk. There's the word walk again. This is our lifestyle, not our position. Who walk, do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. What the law couldn't do in this backslider's slider's life, what the law couldn't do in perhaps this convicted sinner, pre-converted to Jesus Christ, what the law couldn't do, Jesus Christ can accomplish. In fact, the law came to point us to Jesus, a schoolmaster, a tutorer. Uh, it brings the knowledge of sin that we might be driven to Calvary, to Christ, to find the remedy for sin. Not only the penalty of sin, but the practice of sin in our lives. It's by the power of the indwelling Christ, via the Holy Spirit in you and I, that we're overcomers. The imputed righteousness of Jesus for our past, the imparted righteousness of Jesus for our present and all of our future, uh, endless ages to come. It is the very life of Jesus Christ in our soul. And so, again, you have to come, we have to come to the moment of truth where we see the wickedness of our self-centered ways, the wickedness of our sin, the exceedingly sinfulness of sin. It is, as the ch ch chapter title is called, the moment of truth. And you see that illustrated in the seventh chapter when you have these three types of individuals, the law and the spiritual man, the law and the natural man, and the law and the carnal man. And the answer of deliverance is through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And he'll do what the law couldn't do. And thank God for these blessed truths. Let me pray. Father, help us to recognize and understand that this Christian life is not meant to be lived by a set of codes, a uh, moral ethic, uh, a Ten Commandments on tablets of stone that is outside of us or external from us because they just pushed the old carnal selfish uh, buttons to want to revolt against them and create all kinds of wicked desires. But when Jesus, the law keeper, Jesus, the one who never violated the law, never one time transgressed the law, begins to come in and live through us, he will be the one that will keep the law through us as we're in union with him, as we're in lockstep with him, in sync with him. He's the one who uh, promises that we can live without condemnation because we are now in Christ and Christ is in us. No longer walking according to the flesh, trying to do this Christian thing in our own strength, but in the power of the Holy Spirit according to the Spirit. Let that be the experience of everyone listening to this message here today. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. We'll look forward to seeing you next week. We'll be looking at our next chapter, chapter 35 of the book. God bless.